In this evening's lesson, we will wrap up this short two-part sermon series focused on Jesus Christ. Now, if you have not listened uh, to part one, which I preached yesterday evening, I encourage you to go back and watch that lesson sometime soon. Uh, it was recorded on this congregation's Facebook page, and you can stream that anytime you want. And it will uh, soon be available on my own personal uh, YouTube channel. As a recap of how I came up uh, with this topic and title for last evening's lesson and this evening's lesson, I want to restate some of my opening remarks from yesterday. I got the idea to do this two-part sermon series from a photo that I saw on Facebook. In this photo, there are two charts comparing biblical Jesus with modern Jesus and how they oppose one another on various points. Last evening, I had a sermon handout that was uh, passed out before I got up here to preach. Uh, that is very similar to the two charts that are on that original photo that I saw on Facebook. I ended up retyping those charts and made some adjustments on them where I saw fit. If you're listening to this lesson online, I know some uh, aren't able to get here in person, and you'd like for me to send you a copy of that handout, I'd be glad to do that. Send it to you in an email. Just reach out to me and I'll do that. Now as for how I came up, for, came up with the title for these lessons, Last evening, I stated that I did not think that the phrase modern Jesus was the best fit for the points under that heading in the original chart. You see, the points that are on that chart are many false views that people have had about Jesus for the past 2,000 years. They are not new views. They are not modern views. And so instead, on, uh, instead of putting those points under that same phrase on my handout, as you uh, can see, those points have been placed under the heading that I have phrased, Teddy Bear Jesus. And I decided to make it uh, that phrase because of this. While many people claim that they serve Jesus, many people actually serve a false Jesus who more closely resembles a figure who is nothing more than a soft, comforting teddy bear of a person. Sadly, many people are serving the man-made teddy bear Jesus because they have overlooked or they've never learned who the true biblical Jesus is. In this lesson, we will pick back up where we uh, left off from last evening, and we're going to cover the remaining points on the handout, which are points 7 uh, through 12. So that's the points we're going to cover tonight, points 7 through 12. As a reminder of how I will work through each point of this lesson, I will introduce a false view of Jesus that is under the teddy bear Jesus chart, and then I will jump over to the corresponding point under the biblical Jesus chart that refutes that false point or false view. I will then correct that false view of Jesus by revealing what the Bible actually teaches about the true biblical Jesus. As I stated last evening, I believe that these two lessons on this topic, they're very needed. They're very needed for people who aren't members of the church and for those uh, in denominations to hear as well. And I hope that all of us here tonight, including myself, are edified and encouraged by these lessons. Now, like I said last night, uh, it may be the case that some of the people listening to this lesson, uh, that your uh, existing views of Jesus, they may be challenged. And as I said yesterday, that's okay if, if, they're, gonna be, if they're challenged. That's all right. I simply ask that all of us consider what the Bible teaches about Jesus, that we reject and abandon everything uh, any and everything that the Bible does not teach about him. And in contrast to that, I uh, request that we only accept that which the Bible does teach about him. I hope that these lessons will help us all to reflect on whether we are serving the biblical Jesus or whether we are serving some false man-made Jesus, such as the teddy bear Jesus that so many people serve today. It's very crucial for us to examine whether we have been led to believe uh, and accept some of these false views about Jesus. Because if we're not serving the biblical Jesus, then our souls are not right with God. And we need to make some corrections in our lives so that we will be serving the true biblical Jesus. Also, as I noted last evening, each of the false views of Jesus that are listed on the left side of your handout under the Teddy Bear Jesus section, they overlook a characteristic about Jesus that falls into one or more of these four categories. First, they either overlook Christ's deity or His divine nature. Uh, second, uh, second, <laughs> I put a one finger. Second, His divine authority. So some of these points, they overlook His divine authority. 
Third, they overlook his character or how he acts. Or fourth, they overlook his doctrine, what he teaches. Now, before we pick back up with point seven, I want to open with two powerful verses that I think are very worthy of our consideration for this lesson. The first one is Romans chapter 11, verse 22. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, it reveals an important truth about God that many people overlook. That verse says, Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. You know, this verse, it reveals to us that God is good. I don't think that's news to us. We know that God is good. And this, of course, would include his attribute of being loving. But this verse also reveals that there is a side of God that is very serious. In that verse, the word severity, it means that there is a certain level of roughness and harshness with God. And that's one characteristic that many people overlook when it comes to God. You know, the Bible, it reveals to us that God is a consuming fire, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, verse 31. You know, the God of the Bible, He is a God of justice. And when people live in disobedience to Him, they better expect to be met with His severity, as Romans chapter 11, verse 22 reveals. You know, our holy God, He hates sin, and He will punish those who practice sin. And then also, I want us to consider Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, which says this about Jesus. It says, Jesus uh, Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think that's a very great verse for us to consider and keep in mind as we move throughout this lesson. It reveals to us that Jesus does not change. You know, the Jesus that we in 2021 are to serve and follow is the same Jesus that the Christians in the first century served. Amen. He has not changed with the times. He has not changed with the various cultural changes that have occurred in this world and in this country. His doctrine certainly has not changed either. In other words, what he taught was a sin when Christianity began is still just as much a sin today in 2021. Let us now move into considering the seventh point on the handout. So, if you're following along on the handout, point seven on the teddy bear Jesus chart, it says that Jesus gives suggestions, not commandments. You know, this view that many people hold towards Christ, it really shows either a lack of knowledge of Christ's divine authority or a lack of respect for it. You know, sadly, this mindset, it has emboldened many men and women to think of God and Christ as being on the same level as they are. It's brought God down when they, when they have that view of Him. And therefore, many people think that they can decide for themselves what things that they need to do to be right with God, rather than submit to and, uh, and follow His commands. Brethren, although this point that I on this chart uh, probably makes us think about people in denominations, uh, the people who are of the world, and people who are not very religious, I want to remind us and inform us uh, that this mindset has crept into and taken root in some members of the Church of Christ, too. Many people, even some Christians, have forgotten their place in this world. You know, point seven, under the biblical Jesus chart, it reveals that the true Jesus, He commands with divine authority. And we need to respect that. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded, uh, commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. And so according to this passage, how much authority does Jesus Christ have? Well, in that verse, in that passage, he said, all authority. How much is all? That's 100%. Further proof of Jesus' divine authority is that he will judge the souls of mankind based on the word of God and based on the words that he spoke while he was here on earth. In John chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus said, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. 
Later in John chapter 12, verse 48, a passage many of us know by heart, Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has uh, that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And then let us also consider Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, wherein we read these uh, statements. Paul said, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And so considering these three passages and the sobering fact that we all will be judged by Jesus Christ based on whether we faithfully followed the commands of God or not, this shows that what God and Christ revealed to mankind in the Bible, they're not merely suggestions, but rather they are divine commands that we must obey. Amen. You know, this point, it makes me think about how when a parent tells their child to clean their room at their house, that they are not merely suggesting to their child that it would be good for them to clean their room. Rather, they are commanding their child to clean their room, which is well within the right of a parent to do. You know, talking about Jesus, Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, it says this. It says, For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. And then in talking about Jesus also, John chapter 7, verse 46 says, The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. You know, they, they were saying, No one ever spoke like Jesus spoke. He, something was different about him. Something was different about him because he was the Son of God. In various places in the Gospel accounts, we can read of instances where Jesus spoke men and women's sins forgiven, which only deity can do, which further proves that Jesus is deity himself. We can also read of him commanding demons to come out of people with divine authority. A great example of this can be read about in Mark chapter 5, where uh, Jesus healed that demon-possessed man. You know, all of these passages that we've considered, uh, they clearly show to us that Jesus he commanded with divine authority. He wasn't giving suggestions. Now, I will wrap up this point, this first uh, point of this lesson, which is the seventh point, by reading John chapter 6, verse 68. In John chapter 6, verse 68, we can read the famous uh, words of Peter and what, what he said to Christ. And that verse says, But Simon Peter answered him, he said this to Jesus, he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He's saying there's no one else we can turn to. You're the only one that has the words of eternal life. And so since Jesus Christ has the words of eternal life, then what does that tell us? It tells us that we better listen to, accept, and obey those words if we want to go to heaven. Moving on to point eight now. Under the teddy bear Jesus chart, uh, this point states that Jesus promises us our best life now. Many people have that view. You know, this mindset is very popular today among many people in the religious world. You know, in fact, one of the biggest uh, televangelists of our day, Joel Osteen, some of you know him, he has written a popular book titled Your, Your Best Life Now, that very same thought uh, that many people have about Jesus. He wrote a book uh, titled Your Best Life Now. And you know, he's someone who strongly promotes that idea that if you follow Jesus, your life's going to be great and everything's going to be perfect. As a side note, Joel Osteen is not a true Christian and he teaches many false doctrines that reject the plain teachings of the Bible. Sadly, many people, they have been led to believe that following Christ will make their life much easier. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Without a doubt, choosing to become a Christian and to follow Christ faithfully, it is the best decision that a person can make in life. I'm not up here denying that. I agree with that fully, and that's because that's exactly what the Bible teaches. However, choosing to follow Christ, choosing to live your life faithfully to God, it will make your life harder in many ways. And that's what the Bible teaches us. And while many people, they get turned off by hearing this truth, we must keep in mind, and this is the mindset that I think we as Christians uh, can take great comfort in, is that the Bible reveals that this hard life of serving Christ, it is totally worth it. It is so worth the end reward of getting to go to heaven for eternity, even though it's hard. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be so worth it. 
Point eight under the biblical Jesus chart, it states that the true Jesus tells his followers to expect persecution. And so that's one avenue, one area in which a person's life will become harder, where they're going to face hardships for following Jesus Christ. As I mentioned in point three uh, yesterday, last evening, the biblical Jesus, he never promised any of us, any of his followers, a life of splendor here on earth. He didn't promise us that. Rather, as Jesus walked the earth, he emphasized to us the importance of eternity over the material things of this temporary universe, of this temporary world. Now, I could focus on many areas, multiple areas, that show that our life here on this earth is not intended to be filled with peace and splendor. But for this point, I simply want to focus on the topic of persecution. Listen, the true Jesus, he warned his followers that they will face persecution and that they will be hated by the world. He taught his followers that they need to expect such persecution. In John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 13, the apostle John urged Christians by saying, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't be surprised. Expect it. In that verse, John's statement lines up perfectly with what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, which says, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. As I noted last evening, the way that we as Christians live, speak, and act, it steps on the toes of and it points out the sin in the lives of the people of this world. And that is why uh, many people will hate us for that. They'll, they'll hate us for doing that, for pointing out their sin, living a life that exposes their sin. An excellent passage that validates this point is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1-5. through 5. In this passage, Peter wrote to Christians saying this, He said, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in, and here's a list of sins, when we walked in these sins, in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries, Here's the part I want you to focus in on. It says, in re, uh, Peter says, In regard to these, these sins, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And then uh, the last part of this uh, passage is uh, Peter saying this. He says, They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And so this passage in 1 Peter chapter 4, it reveals that, when a person leaves their lifestyle of practicing sin to pursue righteousness and to serve God faithfully, those who know of such a person who are of the world, they will think that it's strange that they no longer engage in those sins that they used to. This passage even reveals that some people will speak evil of that person for ch changing their life around. Now, brethren, here's a question that you should think about. Did you experience that type of treatment, that kind of treatment from the world when you decided to become a Christian? Well, I, I can speak for myself, and I know that I did. I received that treatment. When I stopped participating in various sins that I used to engage in, various people would ask me, why, why, why don't you do those things anymore? Why don't you have fun anymore, is what they try to label it as. And it was because I decided to follow Jesus Christ. You know, when I became a Christian, many people no longer wanted to be my friend. They no longer wanted to hang out with me because I would not engage in the things that they wanted to, which were against God's Word. You know, many people, uh, they've spoken evil against me. They've spoken evil for me for standing up and speaking the truth. But you see, that's exactly what uh, Christ promised would happen for following Him in the Scriptures. And so, I've come to accept that that's just a part of following Christ. And I think that's something that we all need to be reminded, reminded of at times, that we're going to face persecution. We're going to have hardships for following Christ. It's not going to be easy, but we just got to cling to Christ and it'll be worth it. I want to make this point about persecution because I think it's very important. 
if we never face any, fo any form of persecution our, in our lives, then I think that really ought to concern us. Uh, it really should concern us. And here's why. If such is the case, then I think that's a good indication that we are not letting our light shine as we should. Because you see, when we let our light shine in this dark world, it's going to expose sin, it's going to upset people, and we're going to get pushback. And so if we're not getting any pushback from people, it's probably a good indication that we're not letting our light shine as we should. Listen, persecution is it's nothing new to the faithful. Right? It, it didn't just start uh, this year. It's been going on ever since the world was created. Throughout the Bible, it has come to those who chose to follow God, to stand up for God's word, ever since sin entered into the world in the Garden of Eden. The faithful have been persecuted. You know, many people, they've been persecuted in times past uh, that resulted in them being put to death for serving Christ. And, you know, I think this is something that needs to be stated in this lesson, is that we must not think in, uh, in our time today, in the 21st century America, that that cannot happen to us too, that we can't be physically persecuted, because it can. You know, many people in the world today that we live in, and specifically within our country, they are growing not only irreligious, but anti-religious. They don't like religion. And they're even growing hostile towards Christianity. And you know, I would not be surprised if, within the next few years or next few decades, uh, some Christians that are living in America might start having to face physical persecution for serving Christ. And so, are you ready for that? Where's your faith at? Are you going to uh, stand by Christ's side when that comes, or if that comes? Or are you going to deny Christ and, and just uh, cater to what the world wants you to do? The ninth point under the teddy bear Jesus uh, chart, it reveals to us that uh, Jesus promotes unity and tolerance at all costs. Uh, the, the teddy bear Jesus, this false Jesus that many people want to follow, they believe that he promotes unity and tolerance at all costs. And this simply is not true. I saw some of the smiles when I said that. I know you all are on the same page with me. That, that's not the Jesus that we read of in the Bible. The ninth point under the biblical Jesus chart, it reveals that the true Jesus, he brings division when necessary. Now, if I were up here to, if I were to ask you up here, does Christ want unity? What would you say? Does Christ want unity? When we consider what the Bible teaches, it teaches that uh, Christ does want uni uh, unity. He does want mankind to have unity with one another. But I think here's a more important question, or more specific question. What kind of unity does He want? The Bible reveals that Christ, wants for, uh, Christ desires for us to have biblical unity. That is, He wants us to be united in the truth of God's Word. That's something different than those who serve the teddy bear Jesus want. They don't want that type of unity. He wants us, Jesus wants us to have the unity that Paul wrote of to the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. In that verse, Paul said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, the idea of unity and tolerance that the world pushes on us Christians, you know, it's nothing more than a plea for us to abandon our biblical convictions to tolerate the sin of those who want to live wickedly. That's what the world wants from us. They don't want the unity that we read of in the Bible. They just want us to accept their sin. And that's something that Christians simply cannot do. You know, the Bible, it tells us as Christians, we have a duty to expose sin, as Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11 teaches. And we must help people to learn that all sins go against God's will. Listen, if the cost of unity, if it ever threatens us to overlook, to disregard, or to lay aside the truth of God's word, then that is not biblical unity. Biblical unity is based on the truth of God's word. It's not based on the emotions and desires of fallible men. I know that this is not news to us, but we live in a politically correct climate in this country, and that is causing some major problems within our society. But you see, we don't read about uh, political correctness in the Bible. God has not called us to be politically correct. Rather, He has called us to be biblically correct. And Jesus had this same mindset while He was here on earth. 
Jesus was not concerned with political correctness, and as his followers, we must not be either. Now, does that mean that we have the right to go out and spew hate and spew hate speech and uh, speak the truth arrogantly and in an unkind, unloving manner? No, that's, that's not the case at all. Rather, the Bible t uh, tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it reveals that Christians are to speak the truth in love, to speak it in a loving manner, with concern for those to whom you're speaking. However, I think it needs to be balanced with the fact and the truth that even Jesus, while he was here on earth, he brought division when it was necessary, and there were certainly some times that it was necessary. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 39, Jesus said these uh, words that I think a lot of people in the world would be surprised to hear if they've never heard them. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth, or, or on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father more than me, uh, father or mother uh, uh, father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. You know this this passage it reveals that we must love Jesus more than anything else. We have to desire to please God more than anyone else. In James chapter 4, verse 4, James wrote, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Brethren, we are not here to please the world. We are here to please God. We're here to preach the gospel. And we're here to help save the world from sin by leading them to Jesus. Sometimes people of the world, they will say this to Christians, and oftentimes it's a criticism of something we've said or done to them. They'll say, you should be more like Jesus. Have you ever heard that? You should be more like Jesus. You should act more like Jesus. And they're typically, when they say that, they're focusing in on His love and Him being accepting. You know, such people, though, they, they often overlook the fact that Jesus was crucified for speaking and practicing the truth. He was killed for doing what they say we should do. Listen, Jesus was loving. Don't get me wrong. He was loving. He loved the world enough to preach against sin. But sadly, sinful men put him to death for doing so, for doing that. And so if we are to be more like Jesus, in other words, to be more like Jesus is for us to become more hated and to be uh, more despised by the world for doing, teaching, and living what is right. That's what it means to be more like Jesus, to become more hated by the world. Because that's what Jesus was. He was hated by the world. Moving on from there, point 10 under the teddy bear Jesus section is that Jesus serves our will above God's will. Sadly, this is a view that many people hold about Jesus today. Many probably wouldn't say it, but they believe it. We, you know, we don't have the right, as fallible humans, sinners, we don't have the right, we don't get to negotiate with Jesus about how we are going to serve Him. It's not up to us. We don't have that authority. God is the one who sets the guidelines, and we must follow those guidelines if we want to please Him. You see, we're not on the same level as God. God's above us. He is our Creator, and we are His creation. At the beginning of Romans chapter 9, verse 20, Paul asked a very powerful question. He said, But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? I like that question. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Don't you know your place? You're just a human. You're not, in the, you're not on the same level as God. You know, even though Jesus was God in the flesh, even though He was deity in the flesh, he always appealed to God's word and God the Father's will. In John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. As Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus said this to God the Father, Sanctify them by your truth, Father. Your word is truth. I think it's very fitting for this point that we also consider Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, which says, There is a way that seems right to a man, 
but its end is the way of death. In our fallible uh, human wisdom, you know, we oftentimes think that we know what's right and we know what the best uh, path to take is, but we simply don't. God has told us that we don't know what's best for us. We need His guidance. We need His Word. Instead, we need to take Christ's way. We need to take His way only. His way is the only way. In fact, His way is the only way to heaven. There is no other Savior that exists today. There's no other religion that exists today that will save mankind than true Christianity. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, anyone other than Jesus, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so, if we ever get it into our heads that we're just going to follow our will and think that God will just have to accept that, we need to reflect on these powerful and selfless words of Jesus. Look to His example and listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 42. Before Jesus was crucified for us, He prayed to God the Father, saying, Father, if it is Your will, take this cup away from Me. Nevertheless, not My will, but Yours be done. Not my will, but thy will. Consider this. If Christ had to submit to the Father's will here on earth, what makes any human dare to think that they do not also have to submit to God the Father's will? Moving on from there, point 11 under the teddy bear Jesus chart, it states that this false Jesus exalts signs, wonders, and mysticism. However, the biblical Jesus does not do this. Instead, he warns of false signs and false wonders. You know, Jesus, he always pointed to the standard of God's Word. The Word of God is the only correct standard, and it is the ultimate authority on all religious matters. And sadly, so many people are, they just get so caught up and wrapped up in these signs. They get so fascinated with signs and wonders and mysticism, and they put a great deal of emphasis on those things that are insignificant. Yet, some of those same people, they're totally uninterested in obeying God and living faithfully to Him. So their heart's in the wrong spot. Many people, they're guilty of taking various Bible passages out of context to promote false ideas. For example, many people take various parts of the Bible that use uh, uh, various types of language such as apocalyptic literature or figurative language, and they, they take those uh, passages that aren't meant to be taken literally, literally. And some of those passages are found in the book of Revelation. That's a, a key one that many people draw false conclusions out of. Over the centuries, there's been many people who have predicted that the Judgment Day will come at a certain date. And of course, that time's come to pass and they were wrong. We as Christians know that they were wrong and those who uh, try to do that today are wrong as well, trying to predict when Jesus will come back. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus plainly said, But of that day and hour... No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2, the Apostle Paul said, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. These passages reveal to us that no human knows when the judgment day will commence. And so for this example and many other important reasons, Paul wrote this statement in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that ne uh, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God, or rightly dividing the word of truth. Jesus, he warned his followers of false teachers as well. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, Jesus said, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. On a similar note, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, the Apostle John, he wrote to those first century Christians and he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why did he say that? Well, the rest of the verse says, Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. John wrote that we need to test the spirits to determine whether, it, whether they are of God. Well, how do we do that? How do we test the spirits? We do that by seeing if what we are hearing, what we are reading, what we're being told, 
whether it, uh, it aligns with what God's Word teaches. That's how we test the spirits. And if it does not line up with what God's Word teaches, then we can be certain and assured that it is not from God. It didn't come from God. Once again, the true biblical Jesus, he magnifies God's Word and he affirms that it is the ultimate standard of religious authority. As followers of him, we must have that same mindset too. We need to be a, a people who says that we want a thus saith the Lord for everything we believe, practice, and teach. Moving into the last uh, point of this sermon series, point 12 under the Teddy Bear Jesus chart, it states that this false Jesus encourages his followers to love themselves first and gratify their flesh. Isn't that the, the Jesus that most people follow today? You know, as Christians, we know of how wicked of a mindset that that truly is. But I would say that we all in here, as Christians, probably know some people who have such a mindset, and yet they call themselves faithful Christians. Point 12 under the Biblical Jesus chart reveals that the true uh, Biblical Jesus, He commands His followers to deny themselves. That's what the true Jesus commands His followers. They need to deny themselves. Jesus plainly commanded that His followers must deny themselves and they must take up their cross. How often? Monthly? Uh, every decade? Uh, yearly? No, He said daily. Every day you've got to take up that cross and follow Him. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And you know, doing this, taking up our cross daily, it's not an easy thing to do, is it? I think we all know it's not an easy thing to do. However, it's something that God has required of us to be faithful to Him. And the reward of heaven will be so worth doing that, so worth choosing to follow Jesus every day, no matter what this life throws at us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it hits the nail right on the head that we have to put God first in our lives. Nothing else and no one else can come before God if we want to please Him. That verse says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. The inspired Apostle Paul, he opposed the mindset that it's okay to gratify the flesh here and there and to do those things that your fleshly desires want you to do. And he uh, opposed it in Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. In Romans chapter 8, verses 12 and 13, Paul wrote, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Listen to this next part. He says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. He wasn't saying you're going to die physically. He's saying you're going to die spiritually. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You'll separate yourself from God. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You know, the Bible, it teaches us that our flesh and our spirit, they are in opposition to one another. And we must choose to resist living according to our flesh, our fleshly desires, if we want to follow the biblical Jesus. We have to put in that fight. To resist those temptations. I have often observed this, that many people, they have this idea of freedom in Christ as meaning that they are a slave to nothing. But do you know what the Apostle Paul told us, uh, told those Christians uh, in Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, that, uh, that they were slaves to something? In Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, Paul said, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin... He said, Yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. As Christians, we are slaves to righteousness. We must put, uh, put righteousness into practice in our lives. Listen, the biblical Jesus, He requires that we love Him first, and that we must deny ourselves. We must not follow nor gratify our flesh if we want to please Him. We, we can't do those things if we want to follow the true Jesus. So that is the lesson for this evening, uh, brethren. As I conclude this sermon series, I don't want you to misunderstand what I have taught about Jesus. The Bible does teach that Jesus is compassionate. He is so caring and He is so willing to forgive those who will put Him first, who will reject their sin and who will choose to no longer practice their sin. But listen, 
He is not a soft teddy bear figure who overlooks sin and allows us to live however we want. That's the Jesus that many people are following today. Jesus Christ is divine. He is just, he's righteous, and he's holy. Jesus hates sin. He punishes sin. And Jesus calls the shots for how we must live to please God. I want you to consider this. Following a false Jesus, like so many people do today, it's like someone getting in their car and following a map of driving directions that say that they're heading towards New York, but the end result is them ending up uh, heading in the complete opposite direction towards Los Angeles. That's what it's like to follow a false Jesus. It takes you completely away from where you're wanting to go. Spiritually speaking, those who follow a false Jesus you know, they may be convinced within their minds and their hearts that they are on the path to heaven. They might feel very strongly within their hearts that they are. But sadly, if it's not according to the Bible, if they're not following the teachings of the Bible, then they are not on the path to heaven. They're on the path that's leading them to hell. We must make sure that we follow the biblical Jesus. And that's the overall admonition of this uh, two-part sermon series. As Christians, we must teach the lost who the biblical Jesus is, because many don't know who he is. Brethren, I hope that these lessons, they have reminded us of many truths that we as Christians should already know. A lot of these things are elementary things that we should know. But I also hope that there's been some things in this sermon series that you've learned, some things that you have considered about Jesus that you never uh, considered before. If you're here this evening and you're not a New Testament Christian, Here's what you must do to become a New Testament Christian and to go to heaven. The Bible teaches that you must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. You might ask, well, how do I do that? How do I obey the gospel? What does that even mean? What, what is obeying the gospel? Well, here's what the Bible says, and here's how it says that you do that, how you accomplish that. To be saved, all sinners must first, they need to hear the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A sinner needs to hear that they have a sin problem before they can take care of it. They need to hear that there's a Savior that can wash away their sins before they can uh, follow after Him and uh, get right with Him. Next, all sinners must believe the gospel. They must believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God, that He died, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day uh, from the grave, never to die again. They need to believe that. With all their heart. In John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Next, all sinners must repent of their sins. Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Next, all sinners must confess their faith in Jesus Christ before others, as we have a great record account of that from the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto, and the Greek tense of that verse is, is, is meaning towards righteousness. For uh, with the heart one believes towards or unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto or towards, right, uh, towards salvation. In other words, you don't get salvation when you uh, believe and confess. There's something else left in the plan. And that, uh, that thing that's left in the plan is something the world doesn't like. But the Bible teaches that all sinners to be saved, they also must be baptized, which means to be immersed in water. Why? For the forgiveness of their sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 22, verse 16, Ananias said to Saul, uh, he said, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When a sinner does these things, when they obey the gospel, the Lord then adds them to His one church, the only church you can read about in the Bible, which is the one church of Christ, as Acts chapter 2, verse 47 teaches. If you're here today and you need to be baptized into Christ, please make it known. We'd love to baptize you into Christ so that your sins can come into contact with the blood of Jesus and be washed away. Listen, God has done His part for all of us, for all of mankind, to be saved. He's done His part, but mankind has a part as well. They must respond to that offer. If you have not done so, will you please choose to do your part by obeying the gospel 
And then will you please choose to live faithfully to God after? Will you choose to serve the biblical Jesus faithfully? Brethren, if at once you were serving the biblical Jesus, right, I'm talking to us Christians, if you were once serving the biblical Jesus, but you've decided that you were, are going to turn your back on him and you decided that you uh, are going to no longer walk in the light, if you've done that, will you please consider turning back to him? Will you come back to him and repent? He's willing to forgive you if you will repent. If you will come to him in prayer, if you'll confess your sins to him, if you'll ask for his forgiveness and you have that resolve in your mind that I'm going to stop living in sin, I'm going to stop walking in darkness, and I'm going to come back to the light, he will forgive you and he can forgive you. To my fellow Christians, we must be faithful to God until death, as Revelation chapter 2, verse 10 teaches. The end of that verse, it says, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. If there is anyone who has a need to be baptized into Christ so that you can be saved from your sins. Or if there's anyone, such as a Christian, who needs to come forward for reasons such as confessing sins of a public nature, I ask that you please come forward to one of these front pews as we stand and sing the imitation song.